Welcome everyone. I'm Tracy Fitzpatrick and I'll be your moderator today. Thank you so much for joining us here at Netcom Learning, a market leader in promoting lifelong learning, training, and talent development solutions. We are very excited to host today's event, Masterclass, Understand the Fundamentals of Architecting on AWS. And presenting today's topic is Tarumi. Tarumi is an Amazon AAI training consultant and author holding more than 25 years of experience in IT. Her passion for cloud computing developed at a very early age. Being a teenager, she always showed her enthusiasm for understanding the technologies that make computers tick. This deep sense of curiosity on technology led her to achieve all the associate, professional, and specialty certifications and was recognized as an AWS Authorized Instructor Champion. Now, please bear in mind that this is an overview of a very robust topic. We offer a collection of technical and business courses that can be tailored to your specific requirements. If you are interested in a further discussion, you can make an appointment with our learning consultants through our website at netcomlearning.com. Today's session is also being recorded, so you'll get free access to the recording in the next 24 hours via email. Netcom Learning helps customers build innovative learning organizations by achieving a smarter workforce, adopting to change, and driving growth. We do this with a broad catalog of offerings, developing customized learning plans, and our global delivery capabilities. Since 1998, we have been empowering organizations with our managed learning services to help them reach optimal performance results and address challenges. We do have nine practice areas in which we specialize. They encompass people, process, and technology training. Today's presentation is from the Cloud Practice Area. Netcom Learning offers a comprehensive training portfolio of courses for the topic being covered today. Our upcoming classes include various trainings on the given courses. You can also access a variety of marketing assets, such as the free training and blog, by clicking on the available event handout. These offerings can be found with a simple search on our website at netcomlearning.com. In today's session, you will learn the fundamentals of building IT infrastructure on the AWS platform. Also, you will explore the best practices and design patterns for architecting optimal IT solutions on the AWS cloud. And now I would like to give you a quick overview of the logistics before we get started. To begin with, you do have the option to view in full screen by clicking on the full screen button on the right side of the GoToWebinar viewer. Simply hit the escape key to exit the full screen. Everyone has been muted except for our presenters. Feel free to submit any questions you have for the presenters here in the questions pane and we will address them at the end of the session. And to get the best out of today's events, we've included the slides, courses we talk about, and marketing assets in the handout section of your GoToWebinar viewer. You may refer to them at any time to get a better understanding of today's topic. And we do realize that some of you may have to leave early and want to let you know that as you do leave the session today, you will be presented with a short survey. We would like to request for you to take a quick moment to participate in that survey. Your feedback really helps us understand your learning experience and improve our future sessions for you. The survey answers are measured on a scale of one to five, five representing outstanding and one representing poor. And now I'd like to pass this over to our trainer to present today's topic. Hey, Tarumi, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's masterclass. Uh, the title for today's webinar is Understand the Fundamentals of Architecting on AWS. My name is Terumi Laskowski, and it's my pleasure uh, to be giving this webinar for you this morning. Um, let's go ahead and see what we're going to do today. All right, so here's the agenda. There are six major items today. Uh, let me go over that. Number one, understand and apply the well architected framework right so we'll figure out what that is all about next introducing the aws global infrastructure um, number three then choosing 
AWS regions for your architecture from that global infrastructure. And then on number four, we're going to be hitting one of the major services that AWS offers, which is uh, Amazon Simple Story Service and Amazon S3 Glacier. So we'll see what that is all about. Then uh, we'll do a, a little hands-on exercise where we host a static website, and then I'll be open to your questions. Now, between agenda number three and four, we'll take a quick five-minute break. All right, so let's get started. Here is the first item, which is understand and apply the well architected framework. So here's the thing. So let's discuss before we even go to the well architected framework. You know, what in the world is architecture, right? And you may already know, but let's take a look and see what systems architecture is all about. So here I have a very simple um, description of what a typically what a sim, uh, system architecture uh, is considered to be. So here, conceptual design, right? That defines the structure and behavior of a system. So hopefully you don't end up coming up with this, uh, you know, leaning um, tower of uh, pizza, right? So it provides a blueprint for the system that is to be operational, right? So here are some key co components and there are others, but here's some key aspects about what systems architecture is. The architecture should cover components of the system, right? So there are individual parts of the system that perform specific functions, okay? Then eventually you have to discuss about relationships. That means it describes how the components are connected, both in terms of data flow and also how you control them, the control flow. Then you have the behavior um, that outlines how the system operates, right? Detailing the process and operations that will take place under various conditions and et cetera. So I'm not gonna go over all these, but just understand that that's basically what a systems architecture uh, is all about. So then let's talk about next, what is this cloud architecture thing, right? So architecting on the cloud. So architecting on the cloud, then keeping in mind what systems architecture is all about, you kind of put in addition to that, the factor about now you're designing for the cloud. So you want to be able to leverage the cloud specific resources, right? To take advantage of those. And then, you know, modules uh, to design applications and infrastructures, right? So which are what? Remember we talked about components and such? So you have things like, you know, now, your components are not constrained by the physical limitations that you may have in your data centers, on-premises, hardware, and static configurations, which is usually uh, what it is when you have on-premises. So you're outside of the constraints of that. You have very, very dynamic and scalable and highly adaptable infrastructure because they are mostly virtual infrastructures, right? So you have virtual network, virtual storage, virtual uh, servers, right? Things are very much virtual when you move into the cloud. Then businesses in that case can innovate faster right? and scale more efficiently, better meeting the evolving needs of their users. So what does that mean? Well, needs of the users are pretty quickly changing these days, right? So, but if we have physical servers and physical infrastructure, it's really hard to kind of keep up with the changes that are happening in the marketplace and with your end customers. But with the virtual servers, virtual network, you're better able to adapt to those things, right? So it is very flexible, dynamic. That's the hallmark of the cloud. So there you go, right? So that is architecting on the cloud is on top of what we know as a architecture for IT infrastructures, okay? But if you've never been an architect, right? You may, this may still not sound, you know, it's like, okay, <laughs> I think I understand it conceptually, uh, but I'm not sure if I really got it, right? So if that's you, then I prepared an analogy for you, okay? All right, so if we were to take cloud architecting um, and looking at it from the perspective, let's say something like city planning, right? So city planning would be a typical use case for an architect, right? So if you are planning for a city. So if we were to say that, well, if we could explain city planning in similar way, you can explain cloud architecture. Let's see how what that looks like. So the cloud architecture and city planning, you know, you imagine that you are an architect, like a real architect, you know, architecting for the city. 
some, some of the key considerations you may have are these seven items. So I have the blueprint and design all the way down to city maintenance. Now I have uh, slides for each one of those, so let's go over one by one and see if we can get a better handle of what a cloud architect, uh, architect would do. So the first one is obviously you need to have a plan, right? So you have the blueprint and design. Okay. Well, what does that consist of if you are a city planner? Okay. Well, it requires a master plan, right? So you have to have a good design. Like, what is that going to look like? You know, do we have any zones? Do we have like residential zone? Do we have industrial zone? Do we have like green spaces, right? That would be great. Um, so in a similar fashion, Cloud Architect also needs a blueprint, right? That outlines different resources that you may be using, different servers, applications, and, you know, the blueprint uh, as to where... Uh, all these applications will reside right in your cloud and how they will be interacting. So that would be blueprint design phase, cloud des you know, design strategy. The next part is infrastructure, right? So the city's roads, bridges, you know, transportation systems are very, very similar to what we would consider as an infrastructure for the cloud. But for the cloud, instead of roads and bridges, we have storage, we have computes, we have network and how they all connect together, right? Different part and how data moves across uh, these infrastructure, okay? So that would be the infrastructure component. The next thing you do is security, right? You can't really forget security. So um, as the city may have walls, uh, they may have gates, you know, they may have cameras, you know, police forces, what have you, right? Um, to protect the, you know, whoever lives in this city, Okay. In the cloud, we have something similar, right? Except they're digital, right? So that means maybe firewalls, um, access control systems, um, maybe encryption to make sure that, you know, even if the data were to go out, that it would be unusable, et cetera. So these are some safety um, components that you would embed into your cloud system to resist unauthorized intrusions and break-ins. Next one here is utilities. Yeah, of course, right? If you're a city planner, you have to plan for things like water, you know, utilities like electricity, waste management, and other things, right? And that is very similar to how clouds manage services are like databases, you have machine learning, you have data analytics, right? So they run in the background supporting the city, right? Or the, the cloud's core functionalities. And the next one here is the zoning. Remember we talked about in design, we have zoning. Well, zoning regulations, that, so that would equate to resources and service organizations. So just like cities have zoning laws, you know, some places are agricultural, some places are residential, some places are industrial. Sim something similar happens in the cloud. Resources are organized into different region, different zone, and different network. By the way, VPC stands for virtual private cloud with specific purpose and rules and tasks. And city expansion, how about that, right? You need to plan for expanding from where you're at right now. So city grows, require more housing, buildings, roads, services. In a similar fashion, cloud also need to consider scaling. So scaling, you know, out, that is to make it bigger, or perhaps sometimes scaling back in to make it smaller, right? Uh, to ensuring resource can be increased as demand grows and shrink as demand wanes. And then, um, last but not least, you have maintenance, right? We can't forget that. So a city needs maintenance, upgrades, regular checks to ensure everything is working okay, right? Make sure, you know, there's no trash piling up on the road, whatever, right? Okay. In a similar fashion, cloud system also needs to be monitored. Uh, the systems also probably needs to be updated, at time, you know, periodically. And regular review and maintenance to maintain operational efficiency and make sure that everything's working okay. Great. That's a lot of things, and I hope now you have a better understanding of what an architect would do uh, in a cloud systems. But now that you know that, I mean, where do you get started, right? So um, do you have all this knowledge already, or do you go look up in the reference, or, you know, where do you get started, right? So um, so the, the start part is the issue here. That is, is there a great template? Uh, is there some... Um, you know, somebody else's documentation, or do you have it, you know, already in your head, but you've done this before, right? So 
a lot of times we are kind of struggling to find out, okay, I see what I need to do, but I have no idea where to get started. And that's where the well architected framework comes in. Okay. So AWS years ago, when they start growing uh, their cloud business, they also came across this issue as to, hey, is there a great like a sample? Is there a great example? Is there somebody who's actually done this before that we can use as a reference? And they looked around and they found none. <laughs> so they decided to create their own, which is what's called the well architected framework. Now it's available to you as well. So what is a well architected framework? It's a set of best practices. Right. So best practices usually mean what do successful companies do in a similar situation? What are they doing? Right. So that's best practices and strategies for building secure, high performing, resilient, all that good stuff into the infrastructure for the cloud application. Now, there are six pillars uh, to this well architected framework, and these are operational excellence, security, reliability, performance efficiency cost optimization, and sustainability. Okay, sounds good. But let's take a look and see what these things are exactly. And I'll kind of show you how you'll be able to use this when you are you know, it becoming a cloud architect. So I'm going to be moving to that screen right now. So hang on just a moment. All right, so I hope you see the screen. Um, I have gone to the AWS Well Architected Framework page. Um, now, there's a lot of information here, but I'm just going to highlight to you uh, what this is all about. So the link is in uh, the slide, so I hope you'll be able to get access to that later. All right, so here is the six pillars that I explained, right? So here are the six pillars, okay? Let's take a look at a couple of them uh, because there's a pattern as to the type of data that is provided for you uh, by AWS. So hang on just a moment. Let's take a look at the operational excellence. That's usually the first one. So here we go. I'm gonna click on the HTML. Okay, so now you're at the operational excellence pillar. Okay, now they'll have the introduction for you. Okay, okay. All right, so but I'm going to skip the introduction and we're going to go to the um, the actual content of it, which is on the left-hand side. So if you look at the left-hand menu, let me go ahead and expand that a little bit. Here we go. So here we're in the operational excellence um, and you have the... Um, we actually have to go to the operational excellence topic. Sorry about that. Let's get to the menu. So it's at the same place. OK, now all of the pillars for the well architected framework actually has something called the design principles, OK, which is right here. So the design principles are like those blueprints that we're talking about, but they're blueprints for the specific pillar. So this is for the operational excellence pillar. OK, so let's take a look and see what these things are. So here. Let's see if we could fit this whole thing in. There we go. Let me go ahead and reduce that down again. So there are one, two, three, four, five design principles. Okay, so you have perform operations as code. Yeah, everything is virtual, right, in the cloud. Uh, and things can be described like a piece of software source code. And doing operations is no different. So, you know, the, here is a more uh, detailed explanation of what that is. You may want to take a look at that if you're not familiar with something as a code. Uh, infrastructure as code, operations as code, security as code, that's usually the concept. So the best practice is to make it into a, a piece of software, right? Make it into a um, a source code so that you could do automate, automated operational work, uh, repeated tasks, etc. Next one, make frequent, small, reversible changes. So that's another trend in the cloud 
is to do incremental changes in incremental updates, incremental enhancements. OK, so that's basically what the second design principle is stating. Uh, refine operations procedures frequently. It, it goes along with the second one because now we're saying, well, because things change, the way you operate must also change too, right? So the procedures must also keep up with the change. Next one is anticipate failure. That's also true in most of the cloud situation is that, look, you design for failure uh, so that when it does happen, that it's not going to impact, you know, in a major way to your working systems. And then last but not least, learn from all the operational failures so that you can feed back into your current operations and, you know, make it better, right? So that would be the design principle, okay? And all of the pillars will have the design principles, okay? And then they'll have all the, um, the, the information about, um, you know, what those details are. Then uh, you have the uh, organization, prepare, operate, and evolve, right? So that those are the more detailed information uh, about how do you actually do these things, okay? So you can go into detail. So let's go with the organization just for kicks, okay? So organizational priorities, what is that, okay? So here they're going to give you all the references uh, that you may need to actually do the work, okay? To actually uh, implement your design principles. Okay, so there you go. So these are the actual best practices. Now, to show you that, yes, indeed, all the other pillars are just like that, let me go ahead and get back to the well architected framework here and let's take the security pillar, right? So let's see. We'll go to HTML. Uh, and here we go. So if we go to the security and foundations, there will be the design principles. So here we go, let's see, okay? And as you see, there's the design principles once again, okay? Then you have all the rest of the information uh, that gives you details about the, the actual technology that goes into security foundation. But design principles are pretty brief, okay? Then you have all the definitions. Okay, of it. So, for example, if you go to identity access management, right, um, they'll actually give you all the references, okay, to that if you're not familiar with it. So, there you go. So, that is the well architected framework. Uh, and I hope that gives you a, you know, good start, right? If you have never done cloud architecting before, that's where you would go to, right? And like I said, AWS created this from scratch because when they looked around, there were none. Okay. And, um, you know, it's really hands down, uh, AWS is the, the leader of the cloud uh, provider amongst all the cloud providers. And, you know, learning from what they are basing their design on is going to be pretty valuable for everyone. All right, so let me get back into the slides right now. Hang on. Okay, so I hope you're seeing my slides again. So this is where we left it, AWS Well Architect Framework. All right, so now let's go to the next topic, which is introduction to AWS Global Infrastructure. Now, this is pretty important because that's what AWS is all about, is that they give you the foundation, the infrastructure in which you can build your architected uh, solutions. Okay, so here we go. So what is AWS Global Infrastructure? So in the moment, I'm going to be showing you the, the web page that describes in the AWS's own terms uh, what this is all about. So, But just to give you a heads up on that, it's an extensive and geographically distributed network. It's like a global network okay, of data centers and servers and networks and everything that you could think of that is there, you know, what you imagine as a AWS infrastructure. Okay. Now, there are some components here, regions, availability zones, et cetera, that I want to, uh, to explain this to you. Okay. But in order to do that, I'm going to be covering the main parts uh, in the whiteboard. So let me go ahead and switch to my whiteboard. Okay, so I hope you've seen my whiteboard. Um, let me kind of explain first the big chunks, which is the region. So here's the region. And as of this uh, webinar, I believe there's um, 31 or 32 regions right now, okay? 
uh, and they're spread across um, the globe. Okay. So, but every single region has similarities. Okay, so a region is uh, is a geographical location where AWS has certain presence. Okay, this is where uh, one will create your cloud resources. So this is where you would create your network, uh, your servers, your databases, et cetera, right? So, and you don't have to stay in one region, by the way, but I just want to kind of explain to you the components of a region, okay? So these regions are usually accessible, um, usually, I mean, they are accessible from the internet. Uh, I say usually because what you put on it uh, may or not may not have access to the internet. It's up to you as to you know, how you design your accessibility. So I'm, let me just put the internet here. Okay, so they are connected to the internet. Okay. Now each region uh, is divided into what's called availability zones. So let me put, put availability zones here. Let me just for kicks put three availability zones. Okay, so these are called availability zones. Okay, and some regions have fewer than others, usually range from uh, three uh, to six, I believe. Um, those are some of the bigger regions have six, um, some smaller ones have three. That's, I believe, is usually the case. So if I say their region, I don't know, A, B, and C. So why do we have availability zones? Okay. Well, each availability zone is a, once again, geographical location within a region. And normally the distance between each availability zone, let's say this distance here, is usually around three to 20 miles. Yeah, right. It's really far away. And the reason why they're far away like that is because if something were happening in one region, so let's say A had a you know uh, major uh, breakage in uh, you know the water system, and now they're flooding. <laughs> okay, let's say that region's flooding, uh, that the availability zone's flooding. Hopefully, the other availability zone within that region is not suffering from that problem, right? So all the things, all the infrastructure components are safe and dry okay whereas a may not be b is okay and c is okay so that helps aws to keep continually giving you available resources even under these uh, some adverse conditions okay. so then what what are these availability zones and what do they consist of well they consist of hang on here let me get my pen they consist of uh data centers okay so multiple data centers usually um, maybe around you know three or more data centers. I mean, it's um, it varies uh, once again depending upon the location, um, but that's normally, if I were to say average, okay, um, data uh, availability zone will have that. So let's say they all have that, okay, and see here. So let's just let's all make it the same, right? Uh, they don't necessarily have to be the same, but what? Sorry, hang on. Let me grab that. Let's see. Grab this other thing. There we go. There we go. Here we are, right? Data centers. Um, so let's put that in there. Data centers. So these are highly, highly read. One breaks, the other one's still there up and running. So there's redundancy within the availability zone. As you can see, you have multiple data centers and then you have um, redundancy within the region by having multiple availability zones. And now you have multiple regions as well. Right? So you have, like I said, you know, 31, 32 regions right now. So AWS systems, okay. So I'll just put N in there because they're still growing. Okay, so that you have multiple layers or levels of redundancies. Okay, all right, so now with that given, let me 
flip back into uh, the screen, the page that has AWS's global infrastructure explained. So I'm going to switch my screen right now. All right, so I hope you are now seeing the AWS Global Infrastructures page. So here, um, as you can see, ah, oh, it's 32, right? So there we go. So it's 32 launch regions right now. Uh, it says each with multiple availability zones. So that's exactly as how I explained it. Uh, when you put all the availability zones together, there's 102 AZs, right? And then we'll talk a little bit about what these points of presence are, okay? But if we look at the map, there you go. So let's make this bigger. So this is where your systems can reside. OK, we'll talk a little bit about well, which one you choose. That will be a next topic, but you have the choice. See all these little blue or green uh, circles? Those are all um, currently active regions. So in the United States, um, we have North Virginia, which is like the main flagship headquarters, uh, and we have Ohio. Um, then we have Oregon, which is pretty big. Then we have Northern California. Now, in the United States, there are two special regions, which are U.S. government regions called government cloud. Right there, government cloud. OK, um, now I've also worked uh, in Japan. So here we go. Tokyo region, Osaka region. So even though they're regions, you know, they don't necessarily mean that there are separate countries. OK, because in the U.S., as you can see, there are multiple uh, regions within the U.S. So how many countries does AWS span? Well, that's at the bottom here. So you have 245 countries and territories served. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they all have presence in that country, but they reach over into these countries. OK. Um, so there you go. So this is the vast um, infrastructure that AWS offers for you. OK. Now, it may not be too clear as to, OK, so why do we have so many regions and stuff? OK, so we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But just keep in mind that you can always come back here. And by the way, these red spots here, see the red ones? Those are the, the regions that they're currently uh, creating, like Malaysia, Thailand, uh, and Canada West. And also, we can't forget um, New Zealand. So there you go. All right, so I'm going to go back into the slides. OK, so I hope you're seeing the slides right now. Now, we've covered regions, AZs, data centers, right? So we didn't quite cover the edge locations. So what are these edge locations? So the edge locations are a little bit different from regions. And there are tons more uh, edge locations compared to, um, to the number of regions, OK? And the edge locations, let me see if I could get that. Yeah, there's like 450 plus um, edge locations. Okay, So what are those things? Well, let me go back into my whiteboard again. Okay, So you have the regions where one is building your system. So if you have, let's say, a virtual machine, right? So say, oh, I'd like to have some, you know, bunch of virtual machines uh, in my system. And you choose, let's say, North Virginia. You know, basically, you have your servers out here. So if you want some redundancy, you know, maybe you have you know, redundancy in three availability zones, right? What have you, OK? But let's say your customers or your end users are located. You're, you're in North Virginia. Your customers are, let's say, located in Japan. OK, let's say let's just for kicks. OK, so your customers are out here in Japan. OK, and you're trying to provide them some, um, let's say, streaming media, right? Maybe music, maybe video. And, you know, for folks from Japan going all over, you know, all the way to North Virginia, going over the Pacific Ocean and the United States, right? That's a long haul. Uh, so there may be some latencies that is the delays in the file being you know, sent to all the way to Asia, uh, which may not be desirable. So you may say, ah, you know, is there any way that we can get rid of this redundancy? And the answer is yes, right? And the answer is yes, because AWS actually has these things called the edge locations. So the edge locations kind of work like this, and they're, like I said, 240 plus edge locations, right, where your content can be cached. So let's say you cache the content. 
So now the data can be sent from where it is, it is the closest to the end user, like that, right? Instead of sending something from way over there. Okay, so it'll be like a two-step process. Um, you know, you have your data from the source into the cache and into the cache to the hands of the user, you see? So that's going to take care of the latency issue. So that's those are the cache locations. Now, the edge locations aren't all about cache, but it's mostly about cache, but there are other services uh, around the edge locations. All right, so I hope that explains it. So let me go ahead and get back to that. Now, there's something called the local zones, uh, and there's something called the wave zones. So let me briefly um, explain what that is all about. Okay. So the, the local zones are for customers who's not quite close enough to any of the regions. So they'll still be suffering from this latency issue. Okay. Um, so AWS has done something where they actually bring this AWS resources, you know, something similar to what you see in availability zone and data centers, closer to those specific locations that the customers are kind of far away. So these are called the local zones. Now, wavelength zones are um, where you have AWS resources inside a telco, right? So telecommunication company. So you say, oh, well, for what reason? Just imagine something like a, um, a maybe your iPhone, right? Uh, and you have the, um, the latest and greatest um, you know, iPhone technology where you're accessing the internet, you know, very, very fast, okay? Um, but your AWS resources are still out in the internet. So you may not be able to take advantage of that very super fast telecommunications link that you have with your telecommunications company because now you have to get out the telcos network into the internet to access AWS. That once again is going to add additional latency. So wouldn't it be nice if you could take advantage of this very super fast uh, telecommunication link that you have with telco to access your AWS? And the answer is the wavelength zone. So this is where your telcos, not all telcos, you know, some selected telecommunications companies actually has AWS um, infrastructure inside their infrastructure so that you don't have to get out onto the internet. You could stay inside the, the telecommunications company's network to access AWS resources, you see? So AWS is doing a lot to expand their infrastructure so that there are many, many advantages uh, that you can take, um, you know, take and reflect that into your um, infrastructure design. Okay, all right, so that is the AWS Global Infrastructure. So, you know, when I first saw that, I was pretty impressed. I mean, they are pretty extensive uh, and they're growing all the time. But the question here um, is that, well, okay, so I have like, what, 32 uh, options for 32 regions. This is where I build out my system. Like, how do, you, how do I choose uh, from one to the other? Okay. And that is where we're going to be talking about choosing the proper AWS region for your architectural needs. Right? So I'm going to introduce you some criteria that you want to use for selecting one region over another. And here it is. Right? So these are uh, some common ways, common, I guess, criteria that you would use to choose which one you're going to use. So when selecting it, there are several important decision points. Okay? And these are some. One, latency and proximity to end users. By the way, I actually have some examples of the first three, but let me go ahead and go over um, just rough details. So latency and proximity to end users. So that is, you decide, okay, who's going to be using my system? Oh, people in Japan. Okay, where are you located? Well, we're located in North Virginia. Okay, so if you're concerned about latency and being close to your end users, you'll probably use region that is closer to your end customers, which is in Japan. So kind of makes sense to use a region in Japan if that's what you're concerned about, okay? But you may also be concerned about cost, okay? It says, okay, so are, isn't the cost the same all, all around? And the answer is no, right? So if you're creating, let's say, a server in North Virginia compared to creating a server in Japan, there's huge I would say relatively huge, right? Difference in price because Japan um, has higher 
uh, you know, cost of doing business, right? So uh, managing a data center in Japan is much more expensive, I guess, than managing data centers in North Virginia. I don't know what goes into that, but uh, that's that's how they work, right? So the cost will be another issue. Service availability. The hundreds of services that are available in AWS, not all is going to be available in every single region, right? Some services roll out from, let's say, North Virginia, slowly but surely, and then eventually, most likely all the regions will have it, but there's going to be some time delay um, so that some regions will not have newer services available. So if you want to use those newer services, you have to choose the region that has those services. And then you have data residency and compliance. So data residency and compliance talk about, it's not about the technology that AWS has off to offer. They have these 32 locations available to you. But what if your company says, oh, sorry, we can only build our systems in the United States. Okay, so that's going to be your compliance requirement rather than the technology requirement, um, but such as latency. So you definitely have to honor those restrictions that you have and constraints. And then inter-region data transfer costs. So when you're looking at the cost, there's if you stay within the AWS region, some activities are not charged and some activities are charged. But if you have, let's say, systems within AWS that are spread across multiple regions, then getting out of the one region and getting into another region usually do incur costs. So you may want to reduce that, uh, that cost by putting everything into one region, right? So that would be inter-region data transfer costs. Okay. Now, I do want to actually show you uh, some examples of the first three, the latency, the cost, and service availability. Okay, so let's go and take a look at that. So choosing AWS region based on the latency and proximity to end users. So the question is, where's the end user and what is the, the latency that's involved, right? So I'm gonna move into my uh, slides, uh, I'm sorry, my um, web pages right now. So let me go ahead and switch that, hang on. Okay, so I hope now you see my screen. So this is something called the Connection Health Check. It's offered by AWS and the link is in the slide. Okay, so let me refresh this right now. Okay, so this is a Connection Health Check that's actually giving you, um, if you look at it, uh, at the top are the regions, right? So US West, Virginia, Sao Paulo, Frankfurt, Island, et cetera, right? So it has all these. Um, they don't actually have all the regions, but they have the major regions, okay? Then um, they have uh, some speed ratings. Uh, so for me, right, so you have to kind of understand where am I checking this from? So I'm pretending to be the end user, and mine says from where I'm at, okay, West Region, Oregon, will be the best place. It's the closest region where it's giving me a very acceptable Place. So it gives you a recommended region. Now, if I were to use East, um, US East, which is North Virginia, says, well, it's acceptable. But if you look at the round trip time, in uh, it's like more than twice, <laughs> right? So it's double. Okay. Uh, so this will probably give you a good bird's eye view from the user's perspective what the latency is. Now, this may not, this may be okay, right? If you you know, I could probably just do North Virginia still be okay, depending upon the use case. But if we're looking for something that's pretty time sensitive and you know latency sensitive, then yeah, North Virginia probably will not be a good choice if I were to be the customer. Okay, so the the next one that I'm going to show you is about cost. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, services cost differently in different regions. So let me get to that page just a moment. Let me get to the costing page. Okay, so um, there is something called the AWS pricing calculator, which I just switched for you. This will give you some ideas as to, okay, so what are the real differences in cost? So let me go into uh, the cost estimator. So just a moment. Let's see here. I'm going to go create the estimate. Here we are. And I'm just going to pick something simple, okay, like a virtual machine, and I'll compare two locations. I'll compare uh, uh, the North Virginia, and I'll compare Tokyo. Alrighty. So as a region, here we go. As a region, I'm going to choose North Virginia. Okay. 
and the service I'll say EC2. Uh, so that would be Amazon EC2. Okay, so here we go. I'll say configure. That'll be a virtual machine. Alrighty. I'm going to pick pretty much all the um, the defaults. So you know Linux number of instances one and the size. Yeah, just go ahead and pick the uh, you know pick the smallest one. There you go. All right. So like I said, I'm going to keep everything the default. And this is telling me how much it would cost. Uh, Forty nine dollars. Okay, so that's monthly cost. Okay, so 49 bucks um, if I'm if I'm actually running this system. Now, if I were to change one thing, that is, I'm going to change the region. I'm going to change it to Tokyo. So here we go. So here's Asia Pacific, Tokyo. Here we go. Everything's the same. Okay. Uh, and what do I have now? The cost. 73.58. Okay. All right. So not quite twice the amount, but pretty close. All right, so I hope that kind of shows you, okay, <laughs> uh, I better see when, when I'm architecting these things, how much is it going to cost uh, in different regions, you know, and kind of balancing out with the latency, right? So you have to choose, I mean, you, companies usually have priority one over the other. So there you go. So this would be um, some data that you can use that's related to regions and the cost. Now, the third one I want to show you are the available services, right? Remember I told you that certain regions have certain services and not the others, right? So let me see if I can find that for you. So hang on here. Let's see. Hang on just a moment. Let me get that link. Let's see here. Yep, so let me put that in the slide. Here we go. All right, so this link is also in the slide as well. So AWS services by region. Okay, so if I were to go to North Virginia, okay, so and you have list of services. Okay, then let's say if I would go to, say, Tokyo. Right. Now, I can't I can't really tell which one is lacking, okay? But if you know um, a certain service that you want to use and it's not here, then obviously it's not here, right? So, if I were to say, let's see, in Tokyo, I'm trying to think. Let's see here. I don't think they have the deep racer so let's see we go to deep racer all right so so we're looking at deep data sync database migration deep lens direct connect direct service yeah those things are there right so let's see if we have it in north virginia okay okay so now you see there is deep racer there right so Deep Racer was not there uh, in Tokyo, but it is there in North Virginia, right? So, you know, know the, the services that you want to have and make sure that service is available to you in that region that you've selected. By the way, Deep Racer is a uh, one of the machine learning services that AWS offers uh, that uh, is a example of a reinforcement learning, just, just that you're interested. All right, so I hope that gives you some ideas as to, okay, uh, which one do I choose? Well, these are some of the, um, uh, the criteria that you would choose. All right, so let me go ahead and get back into the slides right now. So hang on just a moment. Okay, so now I'm back. Uh, in my slides, and this is where we left it, right? So just as a reminder, so the way you choose which region out of 32 that you have right now is one, latency related to end users. Um, sometimes you look at latency related to where your developers are, right? So, you know, whoever the end users are, either being external end users or internal end users, you know, latency would be the issue. Cost, right, as you saw, uh, service availability, residency, compliance, and inter-region data transfer costs. All right, so and in the slides, I do have all the pages that I explained uh, for your um, latency checker, your calculator for the cost, and also the service availability. 
OK, so this concludes the first half of the webinar. So let's go and take a five minute break. I'll see you back in five minutes. Thank you. Sure, we are now going to take a five minute break. But before we do that, we are going to launch a quick poll that we want to invite you to participate in. Doing so helps us know how we can better serve you by telling us who might be interested in more information or in taking some additional training. In addition, we have a lot more informative webinars coming up, so please go to netcomlearning.com backslash webinars in order to register.
OK, all right, everyone, welcome back. So now we're going to pick up the latter half of the webinar for today. And the, the first topic that we're going to cover is S3 and Glacier. Right. So familiarity with Amazon Simple Story Service, which we call it S3 and Amazon S3 Glacier. All right. So the reason why we're talking about this is because I'm not sure if you know, but um, one of the first services that AWS actually launched uh, was S3. So it's been around since the inception, pretty much, of AWS. And it's a very much a foundational uh, service for a lot of us uh, that's using AWS. So it's good to know. And by the way, we're going to be doing hands-on on this. So here we go. So let's get to know what S3 is and what S3 Glacier is. So here, this is very much a... Uh, an overview statement. And I do have more details on the following slides. So S3, highly available, scalable, durable, secure, all that good stuff, uh, the cloud storage service. It's very much, it's actually designed to upload and download very, very large um, files, right? And we call these things objects, by the way. And in general, these things that we upload and download, um, are referred to as objects uh, and or blobs, right? So blob, no, it's not that green slimy thing. It's a binary large object, right? So that's the acronym for that, okay? Um, so S3 really doesn't care uh, as to what type of file that you're going to be uploading. Um, and um, we'll be talking about other concepts in S3, but we'll kind of keep it. Uh, to now. So in general, S3 is called the object storage uh, because it stores objects, right? Like blobs. Now, what is S3 Glacier? Glacier is actually within the S3 family of storage services, but it acts very differently from a normal, what you consider uh, other S3 uh, services because S3 Glacier is really specifically designed for long, long term archival needs. So that is something that you need to, let's say, store for you know, months and years, right? Maybe for compliance reasons. Maybe you have financial compliance regulation that says, hey, we have to keep our records for the next five years, right? You're not going to be accessing it as much, maybe not, not ever, but you need to have them just in case, let's say for audits and such, right? So that would be Glacier. Okay, so Glacier, you probably know, is like slow moving ice river, right, uh, in real life. But in AWS, this is something that, you know, doesn't change. Uh, you don't access as much. And it's very, very rock bottom prices when it comes to storage. So let's go a little bit more into S3. So Amazon S3, uh, once again, is an object storage. But here are some of the components, right? So the S3 um, service consists of you creating buckets, right? So buckets are things that you place objects in. That kind of easy to understand, right? So you store it in thing called the buckets, right? And then the, the files uh, or data that's inside these buckets are called objects, also known as a blob, right? Binary large object. Now durability is a measurement of a this S3 service where it measures, you know, uh, what happens when systems go down, right? When systems go down, let's say S3 system goes down, um, will your file also be lost, right? And, and durability means uh, no, okay? Uh, there's something called 11 nines of durability. That means chances are when something goes wrong, even with S3, your file will not be lost. So, your data is extremely safe from loss. Not to say zero, you know, uh, possibility of loss, but it, high probability that your file will not be lost. It's called durability. And then accessibility. So data in S3 is you can access it from anywhere, any place, you know, any uh, uh, way you access it. Okay. So that means, and you can also control uh, access to to the public, not to the public to certain people, right? So you have a very good fine granular control over the access to your data. So that's S3, okay? Um, compared to that, we have Glacier. So Glacier, instead of buckets, um, they, they have something called vaults, 
OK, um, and instead of um, objects, you have things called archives. So archives goes into vaults. OK, now the major difference between the two, we'll go over a little bit later on, but the retrieval time is going to be pretty slow compared to the regular S3. OK, because look, the the assumption here is that you're you're storing something for a long period of time that you're not going to be accessing as much. That's why it's cheaper. So if you want to access it, well, you know, there is a downside to this, right? It's going to take time to retrieve. Cost efficiency is like lowest cost storage, right, ever. Uh, so if you have something that you need to store um, that is for long term, this will be a great service for you. And then there is something called Glacier Deep Archive. Um, because there are different flavors of Glacier. Uh, the Glacier Deep Archive is the most cost effective version of Glacier, right? Uh, for data that's going to be remaining dormant, that means you're not going to touch it, right? Uh, let's say, uh, you know, for a long, long time. So retrieval from Deep Archive, though, is typically takes around 12 hours, <laughs> right? So, so the moment you say, hey, I think I'd like to have that server, uh, that, that data, um, yeah, wait like half a day and then yeah, you'll get you get the first bite of that information right in 12 hours. So there you go. So then what I want to show you next is the comparison. OK, so Amazon S3 versus uh, another family of S3, which is Glacier. So I have like, you know, um, six things here. OK, but let me cover, let's say, first three. Right? So rest of it, you could take a look at the slides later uh, and see for yourself. So when do you use S3 versus Glacier? So that's the use case. So with S3, it's for general storage, right? Um, normally with frequent access and you want very fast response time. Well, that's S3 for you. But with Glacier, it's a long-term archival infrequently accessed data. Okay, so the frequency will be different. The next one is accessibility, right? So with S3, it's near instantaneous access. It's very, very quick. But with Glacier, well, it depends on which glacier you choose, but your access would be minutes uh, to hours. Remember the 12 hour thing for the, you know, the, the, the deep glacier. OK, <laughs> All right. so the accessibility and the retrieval time is going to be different and the cost will also be different. So S3, it's a higher cost per gigabyte considering the immediate access, right? Because you have that fast access, it's going to cost you more. But with glacier, cheaper storage but with, with the potential retrieval fees if you are going to access it. So there's no retrieval fee per se for the standard S3, but for Glacier, there will be retrieval fees. So you, you really do want to make sure that you, you're putting data in there that you're not accessing as much because they're going to charge you for that. And then you, know, you have the rest of the differences. So there you go. So that's comparing S3 versus Glacier. Okay. All right. So now the next slice that we're going to go into is actually the hands-on lab and we're going to be doing a hosting a static website okay and then you'll see why we spoke about s3 okay and so here we go so let's go ahead and get into this section which is hands-on lab hosting a static website okay so i guess before my talking about here let me kind of explain that in general when people say, hey, you know, can you host a static website or hey, can you host a website? Right. What does that mean? So let's go into the whiteboard. OK, so let me go ahead and move that over. So when you say web server, right, uh, website, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know about you, but I imagine a server. OK, that's connected to a network. Because it's a web server, you know, it probably need to be connected to the internet, right? So, um, so here we are, connected to the internet, okay, and probably have some, I don't know, web server software running. So may maybe here, you know, you got the like a web server. Application running like, you know, I don't know, IIS. Um, NGNX. Um, Apache. Yeah, just put in your favorite uh, web server application, right? Then you probably have your content like. Index.html. Et 
etc. OK, and if you want redundancy, maybe you have a couple of these things or if you're looking for scalability, maybe you're looking for three, four five, you know how many copies you may have. But at the basis is the structure. You got the server, you have the operating system, you have the web server software, and then you have your content. And you could definitely do this in AWS. Yeah, you could definitely bring up EC2, set these things up. Uh, you could bring up containers, set these things up. There, there are many options for it. But the simplest option is the one that we're going to be doing right now. And now I'm switching back, OK, uh, is do this on S3, right? Well, we just talked about S3. And we said that S3 is a object storage service. But AWS has made it so that there's an option that you can kind of switch on um, to turn an S3 into a web server. Isn't that fantastic? So you actually don't have to set up a, an EC2 with all the service, uh, you know, like NGNX and stuff. You don't have to do that. Um, S3 will serve as a web server, but there is one caveat. So it has to be static website. OK, so uh, it'll serve for you HTML files, the uh, cast cascading style sheet, CSS files, uh, JavaScript files that runs on the client browser. Those are all static files, right? Uh, and images, OK? But it's not going to do any dynamic work on the server side. So it's not like hosting a Java application, right, on the server side. That's not the case. So it has to be static website. But a static website, yeah, S3 just makes sense. OK, and let's see how this works. Now, remember, this webinar is all about architecting. So why are we choosing to host a static website in S3? So what I did here was I chose the, the five major pillars that we had on the, um, the well architecture framework and then refer back to, OK, so the reason why we're choosing S3 to create this static web server is because for these reasons, right? So for operational excellence, um, offers serverless, hassle-free setup. So you don't have to set up any servers. That usually means it's a serverless service, right? There are no servers that you have to uh, you have to work with, and it does integrate with other operational services such as CloudWatch for monitoring its health. Okay, so that's the operational excellence part. Security. I mentioned that S3 actually has a very granular access control. So we can use to integrate with in, uh, identity and access management. Uh, and also there's the encryption option to ensure the secure content management and delivery. So that's number two, security. Reliability, remember we talked about the 11 nines of durability. And 99.99% availability. That means your system will be up and running 99.99% of the time. So once again, that is the reliability to make sure that the website content remains safe, accessible, available, all that good stuff. Number four, performance efficiency. So it does scale automatically to meet the traffic demand. So you don't have to worry about it. Remember, you don't have to worry about the servers and stuff. AWS worries about all that. So there it is. Um, so it doesn't matter if only a few people are coming or massive amounts of people are coming. Your S3 uh, will server, serve your files um, by scaling its power to meet the demand. And then last but not least, the cost optimization, right? So because it, S3 is a serverless service, you only pay for what you use. So you only pay for what you use, eliminating server maintenance costs and all that. So it does match uh, all the five major pillars uh, of um, the well architected framework. So that's why we chose S3 to show it to you. And plus, you know, it's a nice introduction to uh, getting something real that you can use right away. OK, all right. So how does this hands on lab work? Well, there's actually a tutorial uh, on the AWS um, documentation page, and that's what I'm going to follow uh, to do the hands on right now. So in the moment, I'm going to switch to my um, my web pages. Uh, and I'm going to show you the tutorial, and then I will show you me going through it uh, so that you can go through it yourself uh, at your own leisure. Now, the steps that we're going to be uh, going through are eight steps. Uh, so there I, you see it on the screen. So first, we'll create a bucket. OK, remember, all S3 starts from a bucket. So I'm going to create a bucket, which is going to uh, which I'm going to place my web content in. OK, then I'm going to switch on the website hosting service for the S3. Then I'm going to work on the access control. So step three and step four are access control so that 
um, S3 comes with the default encryption and default blocking public access. So if I want everybody to access my web page, I have to disable that. Okay. Then I'm going to add something called a bucket policy, which is a security uh, policy for allowing denying certain things to happen. So I'm going to add a special policy to make sure that people do have access to my content. Okay. Then configure the index document, index.html, configure the error document, error.html, and then we're going to test the website and see if it's working. If all's done, we'll clean up. There you go. So that's going to be the lab. So if we're ready to go, let's go ahead and switch the screen. Just a moment, please. OK, so I have just switched to my uh, web pages. And the here is the tutorial page. So the link uh, is in the slide. OK. Uh, and this is part of a S3 documentation, as you see. It's a user's guide. And there's a tutorial, and there's a bunch of tutorials on S3. So I'm picking the one that says configuring a static website. So there you go. And I have that page right here. So what I'm going to do is because I need to, I need for you to look at the instructions as well as my uh, working on that. So I'm going to split this into two parts screen. Okay. So on the left, I'm going to put the instruction. On the right, I'm going to show you my management console. Okay, so let me go ahead and do that right now. So hang on. Let me move that piece to the left. And let me move that piece to the right. Okay, so I hope this will give... It's going to be a little small, but hopefully... Um, You'll be able to follow along, I hope, uh, with your own screens if you want to. OK, so let's go with that. OK, on the right, by the way, you see me logging into my management console. So this is my account that I'm going to be using. All right, so let's take a look at the topic. So the first thing is we create a bucket. OK, so it says there following instructions provide an overview on how to create your bucket. So let's take a look to create a bucket. Sign in. I'm already signed in. Choose a create bucket choose the bucket name, choose the region, and then accept the default settings. OK, great. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to go to the right right now. And then from the search, I'll put in S3. Great. So I'm going to put the S3. And here we go. All right, so here is a menu to create the bucket. Uh, by the way, you can also go from here and say buckets. So any which way you get to the buckets is fine. And right now I have no buckets, so I'm going to click on create bucket. OK, so the bucket name, um, there is a rule to the bucket name must be unique within the global namespace and follow the bucket naming strategy. OK, so here we are. So I'll say. Uh, let's see if that's unique. Um, I think it might be, OK? Uh, maybe let me put a number in there just in case. All right, so here we go. Nikon demo, website 01. I'm going to choose the region. Uh, so I'm going to choose the um, North Virginia. That's it. And everything is default. OK, everything is default. So here we go. And I'll say create a bucket. And crossing my fingers that the name is unique. If it's not, it's going to come back with an error. OK. So looks like it's good to go. So as you can see, um, there's the bucket now. All right. So step one complete. Now let's go into number two. Enable static website hosting. So as I mentioned, there is an option in S3 where you could turn on a switch and make this into a website. OK, so uh, let me just go ahead and read out the steps and I'll, I'll do the steps for you. So I'm logged in buckets. OK, then I choose the bucket. Choose the properties. I'm in number three. And then I go all the way down to where it says static website hosting, and I choose edit, uh, choose use this bucket to host the website, and I enable it. Great. OK. Then I have to specify what is the name of my index document, what is the name of my error document. OK. And if there's any redirection, I'm not going to do that right now, and I'm going to save changes. OK. Then I'll notice that at the end, uh, when, I, when I save the change, it will give me a URL. Uh, where I will be referring to this website a little, little bit later on. So let's go ahead and do these steps. Okie dokie. So I'm on the right-hand side, 
and then I'm going to choose that um, bucket that I just created. It's not a website yet, right? Then I choose the tabs. There are a bunch of tabs on the top. I'll choose the properties tab. Then I'm going to go all the way down. These are all these options. I'm going to go all the way down to see where it says static website hosting. Okay, right now it's disabled, right? So I'm going to say edit. Okay, and then I'm going to enable it. All right, so when I enable it, it gives me additional things. I'm not going to redirect, so I'm going to have as a host static website. So the index document is going to be index.html. Air document is going to be air.html. So here we go. Index.html. Make sure I didn't fat finger this thing. All right, and air HTML. Okay, so and everything else is fine. I'll, we'll come back um, to this later, but I'll save changes. Okay, so now that I saved my changes, let's go back and take a look and see what it changed it to. Oh, so there it is, static website hosting. There's a lot more information now. It's enabled, um, hosting type, bucket hosting. Yep, and look at that, bucket website endpoint. Um, so there's a, a URL. So let's see what happens. Let me copy that URL. Okay, I just copied it. And I'm going to open up uh, the page uh, and see what happens. Oh, look, it says forbidden. Ah, okay. So it says forbidden because... I haven't really changed anything about the access control. So yeah, the, the website is there, sort of, okay, without the content, but it's forbidden anyway. Okay, so we have to change that. So let me go back and let's go back to the instructions. So the next instruction is to edit the block public access setting. So like I said, uh, S3 comes with a very secure settings for security uh, right out of the box. So if, it's go if this is going to be a public website, we have to open up access. So let's take a look and see what I need to do. So we'll go back to S3 console, uh, look for permissions, right, in the tab. And number four, under the block public access, choose edit, and then clear all public access and, and choose save changes. So the, the security is on by default, so I'm going to disable that. And that's step number three. So let's see how we do. So here we go. I'm still in the, the bucket. Let, let me just go back just to make sure. All right, so here's the bucket. I'm going to click on the bucket. I'm going to go to permissions tab. Okay, here we are. Then if we look at the block public access, okay, and it, currently it's on, I have to change that. So I'm going to say edit, okay, and I'm going to disable all the um, block public access, and I'll say save changes. Okay, then, uh, you know, AWS is going to say, are you sure you know what you're doing? I'll say, yep, I sure do. Confirm. And here we go. And they will tell you, hey, it's off right now. Like, be careful. Okay, <laughs> all right. So now let's go into step four. So step four, add a bucket policy. So now that we've actually made it um, publicly accessible, let's go back to the page and see what, what happens here. Remember, it was forbidden. So let's see if I were to refresh this. Okay, it's still forbidden, okay? But it's actually a little bit different uh, because it's actually saying, look, you know, you don't have any, you still don't have any uh, permissions yet, okay? Uh, so because we have to do one more thing, which is to add special policy to the bucket, which is called the bucket policy, which controls access to that particular bucket. Okay, even though the service is available, the bucket is still not available. So here under the buckets, we're going to go to permissions again. Now we're going to go back into something called the bucket policy, and then we'll edit. Okay, and we'll add this thing right here, uh, which they have kindly put in for us. I'm just going to make a copy of that. Okay, and I'm going to be copying this and then update the resource to your bucket. I have to make sure that the bucket name is replaced with the actual bucket name, and then we'll save changes. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what that is all about. So here we go. We'll go back. We're still in permissions. Okay, but one thing I do have to know is that, uh, let's see. Okay, so there's a bucket name right here, right? So netcom demo website 01. So I'm going to need that a little bit later on, but we're going to go to the bucket policy. So here we are. So we'll say edit. Okay. And here I'm going to copy and paste that thing I got from the instructions, but now I have to update the bucket name. So the bucket name is, hang on here. Uh, 
let me grab that bucket name. Let's see, netcom demo website. And replace that bucket name right here. OK, um, just to let you know, so this is a typical uh, format for a policy. OK, and the way I remember it is that the policy has something called the EAR. So EAR, so effect action resource. So the effect is to allow. The action is to do get object. Get object means to access a page. OK, uh, so access a content. And the resource is my netcom demo website. Uh, website slash asterisk. Asterisk means that all the contents inside. OK, so this should. Be OK, so let's go ahead and save changes. OK, so now the content is now made available. I don't have anything in there, though, but let's see if anything changes here with the forbidden. All right, so here we go. We'll say we'll refresh. And now the error message turns to not found. That makes sense, right? It says, look, yeah. Um, you have access to everything that's in this page, but you don't have any pages. Oh, OK, so the page you're trying to go to, which is index.html, is not there. OK, sounds good. So the next thing then is we go to step five. Configure an index document. So when you e enable static content, it's, it wants to look at index.html. So um, here is a nice little index.html. So you just copy and paste and make into index.html, which I've already done, by the way. OK, and then I save it. Uh, same thing. I'm going to upload that onto my bucket. OK, and I'm going to do the same thing with the error, uh, error file, right? Configure the error document. So step six, same thing. I just create the error.html. Here it says 404.html. I create the error.html, um, and then I'm going to upload it. Okie dokie. So I'm going to be doing step five and step six at the same time. OK, so let's go back. Here and I'm going to go all the way back to the buckets. OK, so here it is. Here's the bucket. OK, then under the objects, I'm going to upload the two files. OK, so hang on just a moment. Upload. And I'm going to drag and drop so just a moment please i actually created them ahead of time yes here we go so the index.html and the error.html okay so error.html and index.html ready to be uploaded so i'm going to upload them You go and it says now it's being uploaded oh upload successful that was quick okay so now you see that there are two files index.html error.html by the way index.html looks exactly like what you see on the instructions here okay i just copy and pasted uh and error.html i just changed the the title right and the body that's it okay all right so now now that i've done that it says test your website okay uh, so now we're going to go um, back to buckets, properties, and you know get the endpoint, which I've already done, right? So on the very first step, when I first create the bucket uh, with the website, I copy the URL. So here, right, it says it was not found. Let's go ahead and refresh. It should go to the index.html. Crossing my fingers, here we go. Okay, welcome to my website. Now hosted on Amazon S3. All right, so now it's working. Now let's go to some place that you know, maybe it, it will give me an error message. All right, so I'll say, let me put the web page in there. Let's see here. It's that's going to index HTML. So I'll say, you know, random dot HTML. All right, random dot HTML. That doesn't exist. What would I get? I should get an error page. Whoops, sorry, page not found. Yeah, see, that was the uh, the the page that I created. So that's the error page. Very very good. So it is working. I'm going to go back to the success. Here we are. And notice how long it took, maybe maybe 10 minutes. I mean, uh, you know, I was kind of talking through it. So if I wasn't really talking through this thing, I could probably create this thing in five minutes, right? Maybe less. <laughs> no, let's not push it. Five minutes. OK, so notice how it's, it's very, very easy to create a um, highly reliable, highly available web server that services your static content on AWS. So. I'm going to go through the cleaning up later, 
uh, but I hope you enjoy the hands-on. So let me go back into my slides. Okay, so I hope now you've seen my slides. Uh, so this was the hands-on that we just completed, right? And we went through all the steps all the way to step seven. So when you have a chance, try it out. And it's it's pretty straightforward, okay? So this concludes the content portion of my webinar. Uh, just to kind of review what we did, okay, what we covered here. Uh, let's go back all the way to the front, okay? So here we are, right? Understand and apply the well architecture framework. Okay, so we talked about what is a well architecture framework, and we use the analogy of creating a city, right, as an architect, and we equated that to how would you create a cloud systems and design as a cloud architect. We also talked about the introduction to AWS Global Infrastructure, where I did a whiteboarding for you describing what region is, uh, which consists. Uh, which has um, availability zones inside, and the availability zones have a bunch of data centers and all those things. That that's where you create your services. Then, when you when you want to service those content, depending upon the use case, you may use some caching locations, uh, which are called the edge locations. Okay. And we also talked about the choosing the AWS region. Uh, so there are some criteria as to which region you would actually select. Now, maybe it's based on the end users or latency to you or the end users. Another one will be cost because all the data centers and regions have different price points for your services. Uh, and maybe it has something to do with your regulations, right? With the compliance. Um, if maybe your company says, no, you can only have it in US, then yeah, you, those are the regions that you have to choose from. And there were other criteria. Then we moved into um, getting to know what Amazon uh, S3 is all about, right? It's an object storage service compared to the Amazon S3 Glacier, which is uh, a archival service. Then we just finished talking about the hands-on lab, and I showed you how you can very quickly create a static website hosting using S3 by using its static website hosting properties. Okay, it was pretty simple. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that content. Uh, and now I'm open to your questions. So let's go ahead and go into a Q&A session. Thank you, Tarumi. That was very informative. I know everyone is looking forward to the Q&A session, so go ahead and start putting your questions into the questions panel. And now I'd like to give the presentation rights over to Remy, our vendor manager, to introduce our promotions and webinar-related courses. Uh, thank you, Tracy, and thank you, Teremi, for this insightful session. I believe everyone must have learned something new today or would have been able to brush up their skills around the fundamentals of AWS Cloud. I would quickly like to take you through some of our hand-picked resources, which we think will immensely help in accelerating your AWS Cloud scaling journey. Uh, well, this document here of, of sharing on my screen, this has been shared with you all in the handout section of GoToWebinar panel. You can download this document and access all the resources and browse all the offerings we have curated for you. So first up here is the list of our recommended courses, which we feel uh, will best suit your learning journey after attending our masterclass. All these courses are hyperlinked. Feel free to go through them post event and check out the course descriptions, prerequisites and the value it can add to you and your team skill sets. Additionally, we have curated a blend of resources, including our upcoming and on demand events, as well as informative and educational blogs. You can make the most of these resources to gain extensive knowledge on the AWS topics they cover. Next up, I am thrilled to introduce the AWS Skill Builder, a dynamic learning center featuring over 600 digital courses crafted by AWS experts. I'm sure most of you must be aware of AWS Skill Builder. What is unique about this platform are the engaging game based learning experiences. Uh, so through AWS Cloud Quest and theme based competitions on AWS Jam events. Uh, if you're hearing these terms, Cloud Quest and Jam events for the first time, I would highly recommend you click on this button and you go to our AWS Skill Builder page. 
I'm sure you will be amazed to see what all the skill builder has to offer. They have set off uh, these gaming experiences in practical real world scenarios, which makes it so easy to understand concepts, technology and processes. And it makes it so interesting for the learner and for organizations. It saves a lot of time on employee scaling and ultimately enhancing the efficiency and productivity. At, uh, as someone at Netcom who values continuous learning, I'm confident that AWS Skill Builder will be a game changer for any organization looking to upskill their workforce on AWS technologies. I encourage you to explore the diverse range of digital courses and experiences it offers. You can simply, as I said, click on this button right here, learn more, and you can explore more about the Skill Builder and the pricing aspect of this. Moving on to the next offering. Our free AWS e-learning courses follow a self-paced training model wherein you get the liberty of accessing extensive course related videos that are delivered by the AWS subject matter experts on the go. So these videos cover the availability on the device of your choice so you can access them from your laptop, your tablet or from your phone as well. There are more than 280 videos covering various AWS topics explained in a very easy to comprehend language. You can simply sign up for free, watch these videos and make the most out of them. Uh, also here I would like to inform you that this session is being recorded. So in case you want to refer back to any of the topics that um, the trainer might have covered in today's session, we will be sharing the recording link with you through emails and also you can access it here uh, by clicking on this button. Uh, so you have to download this handout for that and then if you want to revisit any topic, you can just simply click on the access recording and you can revisit the session and learn at your own pace. Now, apart from our virtual sessions, you can also catch the relevant updates related to IT and business trainings on our social media handles. So please feel free to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel for all the latest updates. Our official pages and channels are linked here on the icons. Finally, if you have any suggestions regarding the topics you would like us to cover in our upcoming webinars and masterclasses, please don't hesitate to send us a direct message or you can leave a comment on our social media posts or you can just simply email us at info at the rate netcom .com. We would definitely try to come up with the sessions on your suggested topics. Thank you once again for joining us today. Over to you, Tracy. Thanks so much for guiding us through that information, Remy. And now we're going to go ahead and jump right into our question and answer session. The first question we have is, are there any recommended approaches for managing secrets and sensitive information in an AWS architecture? Great, well, thank you very much for that. So this gives me an opportunity to kind of go back into what we talked about today, which is the AWS Well Architecture Framework, right? So let me go ahead and switch the slide right now just to kind of show you that. Hang on. Okay, so I hope you see the uh, AWS Well Architected page. Okay, so here we have the security pillar. So because that would be uh, managing, uh, Right, so managing secrets, right? Sensitive information, so that this will fit right here. So let's go into the HTML. And uh, let's take a look at the foundation for design principles. And I would say the question that that you're referring to applies to protect data in transit in at rest, right? So it says classify your data into security levels such as sensitive, as you mentioned, uh, use the mechanisms such as encryption, tokenization, and access control where appropriate. So that's going to be the general guideline, but design principle. So then, but what does that mean specifically? So here, now we're going to go to the left-hand side, data protection. We have data classification, protecting data rest, protecting data in transit. So um, your you know, secrets have to be protected in all these, right, at rest and also in transit. But let's just take a look at one, right, data at rest. So if we look at data rest, 
what do they recommend? But, you know, we're not going to go into tokenization. If you're interested, please take a look at it. It's a real neat technology. But in general, you, as a minimum, you have to do encryption. Okay. So what services gives the power of encryption within AWS? Right. Now, there are several services that you can use, and I'm just going to mention three. So one is called the Secrets Manager. Okay. And I'm just going to quickly show you what these things are. So here, if I go to Secrets Manager, so there it is. There's that service. So the Secrets Manager is where you keep your secrets, right? So you user ID, password, uh, type of stuff, and you create a store, the new secret, so that you can keep your secrets um, in a separate, encrypted, well-protected service, separate from your code that actually requires that secret. So the recommendation is never to embed security secrets inside your code, let's say, or in your configuration, but keep it separate. Okay, so that would be the secrets manager. Now there is a something else called the parameter store, which is a service for more of a generic. Um, items like configuration items, but the parameter store, uh, which is part of the systems manager. So here, uh, parameter store, right? It's parameters, but secrets are also parameters. So you can keep it here too. And I have a tendency to use parameter store more than the secrets manager because it's more generic and it's, uh, it's, it's actually no cost. So, uh, and it also includes encryption. So I usually choose that. And last but not least, there is a, another service called the um, uh, key management service, which is KMS. So if I say KMS, key management service, here it is. So this is a service that actually allows you to encrypt your data in, in a generic way. So this is all about encryption. It's not really about storing of that, uh, uh, you know, the secrets. Uh, sensitive information because that depends upon where you have that secrets. But if you want to use encryption, power of encryption in AWS, then you need something called the keys. And here is a key management service, which is highly, highly secure. So I hope that gives you some ideas. Now, best practice though, is make sure that, you know, going forward using any of these services that you have to keep in mind a couple of things. So least privilege. Least privilege is that you only give access to data the, to the people that really, really need it. Right. So don't give overly permission stuff because that's going to ruin your access control. You have to always audit and monitor your usage, even though you're using the secrets manager or the parameter store or the KMS. You have to always kind of keep and check and make sure that they're being used properly. OK, and also, you know, don't hard code the secrets into your code. Don't do that. Right. Uh, because that, that that is against the best practice. It's always good to separate using these services. All right, so I hope that gives you probably more information than you probably are asking for, uh, but I hope that answers your question. Next question up in the queue is, how can I effectively manage and control costs while designing architectures on AWS? All right, so thank you for that too, because that also relates to what we discussed, right? So I showed you that in choosing the region that you select the region that has the, the best cost profile that you're looking for. But of course, cost isn't the only decision factor that you have to take in, right? But because in choosing a region, you have to choose the latencies and the laws and regulations and all that, right? But, you know, cost is one of these, um, uh, one of these uh, decision points. Let me actually flip back uh, to the, um, to the slides right now, because I think you're on the web page. So hang on just a moment. All right, so to answer your questions about the cost, okay, um, in addition to what I've already mentioned in the webinar about choosing the proper region, one thing you have to do is you have to choose the right size for any resources that you are using on AWS. So let me give you one example, um, EC2. So EC2 would be a virtual machine service. Well, when you're selecting a virtual machine, you get to choose, hey, how many uh, CPU cores do I want? How much memory do I want? Do I need any specialized hardware? Do I need CPU, GPU? What what do I need? So don't choose the biggest and baddest server, right? Choose the right size. If you only need two CPUs, just choose two CPUs. Don't choose four CPUs because that's going to cost you more money. So it's called right-sizing your resources, okay? Now, once again, on the EC2, 
and also for the relational database services and other services, there's something called the reserve instances and savings plan. So this is more like a volume discount. So if you, AWS is like any other you know, business, if you commit for a long term, they'll give you a very good discount for it, okay? So if you know that you're always gonna be using five servers, yeah, then, then you know, reserve those instances. Now, the only downside is that you have to commit uh, to that, you know, how many ever servers that you want for one and three years, okay, one or three years, um, but you get very, very deep discount, you know, upwards of, depending upon what you're looking for, upwards of like, you know, 60 to 70% discount from a standard pricing. Okay. Now, once again, staying with the EC2, uh, there's something called the spot instances. So the spot instances is like a very deep, deep discount on the EC2, the virtual machine, when there is uh, excess capacity on the AWS side. So uh, relatively speaking, if there are fewer customers wanting to use EC2 and you want to use an EC2, well, you know, there's maybe an excess demand, uh, I'm sorry, excess resources uh, on the AWS side. So they'll give it to you for very, very low price, upwards of like, you know, over 90% uh, off from the standard pricing, okay, uh, maximum. But the downside is if the, the demand changes, then now there's more demand uh, for EC2 in AWS. Now AWS says, oh, okay, so now there's more people wanting to use EC2. Now the prices go up. So they may come back to you and say, hey, you know you know that EC2 spot instance that I gave you? Oh, I need to take that back uh, because now too many people want it. Um, so sorry. And they'll take it away in two minutes. Um, two minute warning. Um, now, AWS does say it doesn't happen that often, but you know there's always a possibility that your EC2 will be reclaimed. Okay, so make sure that you know whatever the service you use spot instances for is that you can react automatically to that server possibly going away. Okay, so there are clearly use cases where you can't use the spot instances; it's just too risky. But there are others where you have multiple worker nodes such as an EMR, Elastic Map Reduce, where when you lose one server, uh, that doesn't hurt the entire uh, solution, right? So pick and choose the use cases, but uh, spot instances will be one of these options. And for other services, there are similar type of uh, cost savings. So explore into a particular service and look into the documentation and see how you can take advantage of these uh, deep discounts. I hope that answers some of your questions. And finally, last question for today. What are some considerations for optimizing performance and latency when designing for global deployments on AWS? Great, thank you for that. So once again, going back into what we discussed in the webinar, choosing, you know, remember one of the criteria for choosing which region was latency. So uh, if latency is one of your major concern, then see where your users are and use the region that is closest to that uh, end user. But what if you have global audience, right? You can't just choose and say, oh, it's not just Tokyo. Maybe it's Europe. Maybe it's United States. Well, what do you do in that case? Remember I told you about the edge location, okay? The, the caching service is called the CloudFront. And you can use CloudFront to deliver content to wherever the is the closest uh, to wherever your end users may be, right? So if your content is Cacheable, that is, it's a, it's a, you know, it's com, you know compatible with caching. Then you would definitely use that. Now, if um, another option is to use a multi-region deployment, so you say, oh, my customers are divided between Asia and Europe. Okay, then perhaps use two regions. So you use the Pacific region uh, and European region. That you can do as well. Now, there is a service called Route 53. So Route 53 is basically a DNS service, domain name service, um, but the Route 53 actually has additional power of something called latency-based routing. So if you have systems uh, in multiple regions, and if you put a, a Route 53 on front of it, then depending upon the latency to that user, Route 53 will direct your request to the lowest latency location that it knows, right? So that's another way of uh, reducing latency and optimizing performance. Now, there are other uh, strategies that you can take. For that, uh, please come on over to the uh, Architecting on AWS. We'll be talking about those kind of things. By the way, for those of you uh, referring to the earlier question about costing, there's actually a course um, just for your financial professionals as to what the 
cost structure is on AWS and how you can reduce the cost. So, you know, uh, come on over and I look forward to seeing you in those classes. Once again, I want to remind you that as you leave the session today, you will be presented with a short survey. We would like to request for you to help us by taking a quick moment to participate in that survey. Your feedback really helps us understand your learning experience as we are constantly looking at how we can improve our future sessions. The survey answers are measured on a scale of one to five, five representing outstanding and one representing poor. We want to thank all of you for joining us today. And if you do come up with any additional questions, feel free to send them to webinar at netcomlearning.com at any time. We hope that you found today's webinar informative and we look forward to seeing you back here with us soon. Feel free to tell your friends and colleagues about our webinars and other courses. Have a great day, everyone.